You, me, and HIFMB. Stories of science and the sea. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the HIFMB podcast again. Uh, back from the summer break and the summer um, the interruptions. Um, today, I bring to you Medica Agus Saputra, a PhD student from Indonesia. He works on the Benthic Geopolitics Project, which uh, formerly was a focus group by Kate Semler and now has joined forces with the governance group of Kim Peters. In there, we talk about his uh, fieldwork in Indonesia and his work with tin divers, so divers that recover tin ores, the metal from the seabed. And the work he does when it comes to the seabed and the geopolitics around the seabed. So he does work on undersea cables, tin mining, as we said, and much more. And he constantly flips perspectives in his work. So he applies a feminist geopolitics lens onto the tin diving uh, and also a volumetric approach. So where he um, takes the perspective of the diving cave. So it's a very interesting way of, of narrating and storytelling. And he actually won an award with it at the Mare conference. He won best student paper. So yeah, reason enough to listen in and learn more about this paper and about the author behind it. So without further ado, I give you Medica Agusaputra. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the HIFMB podcast. And today I have Medica Agusaputra from Indonesia with me. Hello, Jan. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, no worries. So excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for me as well. So you're a PhD student here at the Institute? Yes, I'm a PhD student here at HIFMB and my um, my focus group is Marine Political Ecology Focus Group. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing my PhD research projects called Pendic Geopolitics. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and the focus group um, that is led by Kate Samler. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right now, because Kate moved to Twente, yeah. now the group is under Kim supervision ah, okay. under Kim's yeah. right okay so, so with the governance group together. yes absolutely yeah. cool okay all right so what's your PhD on so you just said benthic um, political ecology benthic geopolitics Ge yeah. geopolitics sorry benthic geopolitics can you explain a little bit what that is uh, yeah thank yeah. you uh, so benthic geopolitics is actually trying to add benthic in the in analyzing geos in geopolitics so when it comes to geopolitics especially in human geography or political geography and other studies they are now focusing on the material side which is the geo mm -hmm. and the geo has been defined as elemental or geologic space yeah. while benthic um, encompasses not only elemental space or geologic space but other material temporal uh, technological and also spatial dimensions so i want to add that yeah. in this uh, geopolitical analysis so basically mm. uh, then because benthic means anything related to or occurring on the seabed so yeah. we focus sorry i <laughs> focus on the seabed utilization like yeah. Offshore tin mining, uh, undersea cables, undersea pipeline, and tin diving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned before when we talked off the air, basically, um, that this thing benthic um, is a very scientific or, or natural sciences word and hasn't really been applied in, in the humanities yet, but yeah. you're using it now. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that is also the, the plan. So adding the benthic concept into humanity or um, human geography, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is the the idea of this work. Yeah. yeah, and you brought a paper today, which is called, or not a paper yet. It's a it's a PhD chapter um, of yours, which focuses on the tin mining that you mentioned before. So tin, the the metal, the the element, and the the chapter for now is called uh, volumetric embodied and granular geopolitics of the seabed, offshore tin mining in Indonesia. Yes. So I imagine that hits very close to home with, with you being Indonesian. And can you explain a little bit how the how the chapter was created and, and how the idea came about? Yeah, so the idea is it was because I was doing my uh, fieldwork in Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, specific, specifically of Bangka and Plitung Island, mm -hmm. where I follow uh, tin divers and geologists and... Um, in my fieldwork, I encountered tin divers who uh, dive into the seabed cave, they call, yeah. uh, like uh, the big 
hold on the desi pad mm-hmm. uh, or called previously mine C pad. Yeah. So they dive into this uh, into this uh, C pad cave to recover tin ores or critical mineral mineral for um, electronic device manufacturers yeah. and also weaponry industries. Mm-hmm. However, um, why I get inspired from this uh, mundane or everyday activity of teen divers diving into the seabed is because their story has been mostly occluded in the geopolitical interventions mm-hmm. like in the international teen market or in even in our regulatory interventions although they are contributing to uh, national economic income through uh, through selling their tin ores mm-hmm. yeah so yeah. that is uh, one of the inspirations Cool, I really cool. I mean, I mean, not that I uh, work in tin much, but I, I certainly haven't heard about it. And, and certainly not that there are actually divers, so humans who, who recover it just with a uh, very rudimentary diving gear, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. They actually use different types of uh, diving gears, like convention, conventional diving gears, like air compressors, yeah. and also breathing pipes, mm-hmm. and also suction pipes. So mm-hmm. pre- breathing pipe and suction pipes yeah so they use uh, air compressor and that they connect with the breathing pipe so they can breathe under the water Mm -hmm. under the sea and then they uh, vacuum the ocean floor or on on uh, vacuum the seabeds Mm -hmm. uh, the seabed cave to actually get the seabed sediments including the tin ores yeah and you've interviewed them quite a lot, right? The tin divers. Yes, I interviewed them quite a lot, and also I uh, I conducted participant observation where I join on their wooden raft. So they have wooden raft, mm-hmm. and then with this wooden raft, they put the air compressors and all the diving equipment. So I also use this GoPro yep. uh, camera. I uh, mounted my GoPro cam- camera with uh, anti-water or waterproof mm. uh, accessories, put it on them, and they dive uh, into the seabed pit or seabed cave. Uh, so I try to understand how they encounter the seabed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what what were your mind findings? So what what was the main thing that you took away from those interviews? So from this interview and from the participants, participant observations, I try to focus on the three aspects of tin divings. Mm -hmm. First, I focus on their bodies, so tin divers' bodies, how they feel, uh, the pressure, the temperature, and also the risk of getting buried under the sea or under the seabed because it's very uh, precarious wall of the seabed. It can, you know, collapse any time. Um, and, and, and then secondly, I focus on the volumetric space of the seabed cave that mm-hmm. is very inaccessible for many people, including even like regulatory intervention. So we know that regulatory intervention, I argue here, that it, it also ceases to apply when it comes to the volumetric space because it only governed on the surface. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the last one is I focus on the geologic materiality, which is the tin ore itself, mm-hmm. that has the agency or the capability of influencing things or process. Yeah. Uh, so the tin ore actually inspire or encourage uh, tin divers yeah. to, to find the tin ore. So instead of, for example, complying with marine special planning regulations, mm-hmm. they actually comply more with the tin ore. So I look at these three apartheid yeah yeah that's it's a really cool i i've never seen this type of study or, or this type of writing or um yeah this type of approach being done in a piece of writing where you at first focus on the body perspective then on the volumetric perspective of the cave and then of the geologic perspective of the ore yeah so of the tin it's, yeah, it's really cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's really nice thanks, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, you should read it if it uh, uh, when it comes out. I think currently it's under revision. You, you're trying to publish it. Yes, it's been like a struggle, of course. As yeah. a PhD student, uh, I try to incorporate all the feedback from uh, the reviewers. So it's still under review. So wish me luck. Hopefully yeah, that absolutely. I can yeah. put this in publication and hopefully, yeah, audience here can uh, read and enjoy yeah. the article. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. They will. It's such a cool, unique way of, of uh, storytelling or, or I don't know if it's storytelling. Yeah, exactly. But storytelling. Yeah. It's about storytelling here. Okay, yeah. great. Nice. So, the story that has been made invisible. So we try to make it visible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what you mentioned before is um, in classical geopolitical approaches, this perspective has been obscured and, and flattened the, the, the conflicts that occur on the seabed. 
Definitely. Yeah. So you mentioned that they render um, the space two dimensional and inanimate. Oh, that's a yeah, inanimate. Yeah, inanimate. <laughs> that's <laughs> one hard word. <laughs> actually, thanks to Kim. Kim actually yeah. <laughs> gave me that word out to describe that. <laughs> yeah, right. And and now you're you're. You're making it more. You're putting more dimensions into this. This is really cool. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. So I think I need to clarify what we mean by classic geopolitics here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yes. the classic geopolitics here is basically um, country or state interventions like uh, marine spatial planning mm -hmm. or OECD. This is like the organizations, international organizations, where uh, they have international tin buyer members and also countries that import uh, tin ores from Bangka Belitung Island. So, mm -hmm. so through their, for example, through marine spatial planning, of course, they convert the seabed into a flat two-dimensional space. But when you look at the tin diving experience, you understand that there is a cave as well. Mm -hmm. And this cave is not like lifeless or what we call terra nullius or no mm -hmm. man's land. There is actually people there in yeah. this cave. Yes. but but it has not been well documented officially. There is no report, so you not you cannot find any report about tin diving, mm -hmm. especially official one. Uh, so there's NGO report about the accident of the tin diving, but we cannot find like it's it's really hard to find like official report like article that really discuss this uh, intimate experience between yeah. tin diving and the seabed cave. So I tried to provide different perspective that you know to go beyond the flat mm -hmm. representation of the msp map mm -hmm. towards the experience of the tin divers on mm -hmm. everyday basis yeah, yeah. Who, who were the tin divers mostly are, are they largely indonesian or uh they are largely indonesians they are largely even indigenous uh, oh, right. okay. people yeah. um, that actually rely their life or their livelihood on tin ore Mm. Uh, production. Yeah. So yeah, they are indigenous people in Indonesia. Okay. Uh, the ones that always get the uh, regulatory interventions, but never been heard before. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to change that. Yeah, we try to change that with this article. Hopefully. Yeah. yeah that's good. <laughs> Do you know how long tin mining has been going on for in this way? In this way, it's been ages. Yeah. <laughs> I would say okay. yeah, right. because. First of all, we have to talk about the history of tin mining. So yeah. tin, tin mining has been existing since uh, Sriwijaya Kingdom. And then Sriwijaya Kingdom, uh, one of the kingdom in Indonesia, mm -hmm. has been subdued by the, by the British Empire. Mm. And then further, it were, uh, Bangka and Pelitung Island were traded to um, Dutch oh. Empire okay, or yeah. Dutch East Indies, yeah, okay. um, if you will. And then through this colonial empire, they actually employ the tin divers, uh, in the indigenous Malay people yeah. on this island and also Chinese people. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese people, um, they are tasked, they were tasked to actually identify the tin ores and then the, the divers uh, were the indigenous people themselves. Right. And these practices uh, had been carried out up to the presence but maybe the difference is the technology and also the capacity or the capability of accessing the seabed mm. so now you said um that the tin divers they're largely using compressors and and like air hoses to dive so they're not really using normal recreational diving gear or no they don't have this uh, recreational diving gear or modern diving gear so they really use conventional rudimentary uh, diving gears mm. yeah and they don't i'm, I'm sure that then they don't follow normal diving uh, security protocols. They don't follow the uh, good uh, practices of, um, you know, diving, yeah. Yeah. like recreational diving. Um, but indeed, there are some like uh, NGOs mm -hmm. on this island that they care for the health and the safety of the endeavors. Some of them are doing community service to, you know, educate uh, tin divers on how to avoid, for example, tin decompression. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they, they share this kind of knowledge in order to reduce uh, decompression sickness, yeah. um, risks, and also other physiological risks yeah. from everyday diving. Mm. Yeah, the, 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 you mentioned before they dive every day. 
Except Friday. Except Friday, except Friday okay. because Friday is like a Muslim Friday prayer, something mm-hmm. like that. So they they do not uh, work on Friday, but um, on the other days, on the everyday basis, they work from seven a.m. to one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just under under the sea. <laughs> yeah, just diving up and down. And yes, yeah. just diving up and down. Yeah, yeah. and so it's it's really interesting when, when when you also know how they actually know when they get the thin ores mm-hmm. because they have signs. Okay. So what they do is um, basically three members. Mm-hmm. One is a diver, mm-hmm. and the two persons on the wooden raft. Mm-hmm. Their roles are to uh, look at the quality of the tin ores mm. and also to uh, make sure that there is no police officers oh. going around, for example, something okay. like that. Yeah. And then uh, when the people, like when their members, their diving crews on the surface actually look at the sediments and the sediments uh, becomes black in color, mm-hmm. that means it contains Thin ore. Ah. So what they do is they will give a sign to the thin divers on the seabed by um, by how do you call this? Like bending oh. by bending the pipe oh. four times. Okay. The more like the maximum is four times. Yeah. Uh, so four times means that this uh, mining site, the seabed, contain a lot of thin ores mm-hmm. and. This also actually very risky, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I do not know when you, when somebody actually find your breathing pipe. You yeah. feel for me, I will feel uh, anxious and yeah. and crazy, you know, under the, under the seabed. But for them, it's it's different perspective because when the their friends, their mining, their mining crew, sorry, their diving crews yeah. give this sign, they are feel more motivated, so they fuck you more and more, so they go deeper and deeper. So they dig deeper and deeper um, on this seabed cave. Okay. But consequently, because they are too motivated, sometimes yeah. they say that we forget that we actually under yeah. the sea and under the seabed and have the risk of getting buried alive oh, shit. under the seabed. <laughs> yeah. 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 I imagine there's a lot of sicknesses going on as well and, and a lot of decompression sickness or problems with ears and yes they suffer from ear infection ear impairment and also stroke mm. heart attacks yeah. um and maybe it's also because of the physiological problem mm. from you know going to the seabed cave mm-hmm. on their daily basis mm-hmm. that's actually from marine ecologists that i interview because one of the marine ecologists who work as a coral reef restoration Mm -hmm. who work to basically restore the coral reef i mean Mm -hmm. i mean he told me that the thin divers suffer from this kind of health problem Mm. from stroke and heart attack numbness Mm -hmm. and ear impairment yeah Yeah. wow that's that's insane and i noticed in your in your cv which we're going to talk about in a second um that you from uh, March 2019 to August 2019, you worked as a governance researcher for the Responsible Mineral Initiative and already worked on tin mining way before your PhD. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I was uh, employed by Responsible Mineral Initiative. Mm-hmm. It is a coalition of electronic device company members. So they build this kind of like coalition or organizations mm-hmm. and they are trying to map and identify the stakeholders of the offshore tin mining operations and also good practice good practices of of the offshore tin mining operation because offshore tin ma- mining operations for them is quite new because mostly they focus on uh, land based mining not yeah. offshore tin mining so yeah i was working to map the stakeholders and also potential good practices that could sustain this industry mm-hmm. but yeah it's quite weird right now what we mean by good practices here is also something that is very debatable yeah <laughs> as i yeah as i enter my phd yeah where did you do that as a governance researcher was that in indonesia as well i was employed by the united states organization so this organization okay. is based at the united states okay of yep. america they were allowing us to work remotely okay. so we could do the research remotely yeah. and provide the report to them yeah, okay. from our research. Okay, since we already moved into your paper, is under review, like you said, currently, and uh, will be out in 
the coming months probably and uh you hopefully yeah, <laughs> exactly no no it will be. Like. <laughs> <laughs> no and and you can read all about it i mean the you the audience can read all about it so for now uh, let's chat about your life so your academic career started in 2011 when you started your bachelor's yes yeah. so my bachelor was um focusing on aquaculture and fisheries and marine so much mm -hmm. more natural science yeah uh, when i was in my bachelor mm -hmm. that then at that time i did my thesis or like bachelor thesis okay um on marine sea pollution so i tried to look at the pollutions in one of the sea in my island mm -hmm. and afterward i found that why well, I, i collected a lot of data but i you know yeah i didn't know what is going on why mm -hmm. the marine pollution keeps going on and uh, how all the regulatory interventions and the policy makers work on for example reducing the po marine pollution here mm -hmm. so i was so curious about this kind of like regulatory interventions and yeah. the governance be behind uh the marine pollutions and in 2016 i continued my master study in Wageningen University and research the Netherlands mm -hmm. so then I shifted from <laughs> natural science to marine governance yeah um also dealing with the benthic ecosystem at that time I focus on lobster fishery uh, illegal yeah. lobster fishery and try to understand why the regulatory intervention failed to reduce uh, illegal lobster fishing in Indonesia mm -hmm. And from that moment, because I engaged with the uh, seabed mm -hmm. from this illegal ah, okay. lobster fishery, uh, I then applied for this uh, project, yeah. Bendic Geopolitics, because lobster is also about benthic ecosystems. Absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah, that is basically how I end up here at, at SIFM, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but you mentioned during your bachelor's, you did it at an island or, or your island that, that yes. you mentioned i'm very bad with indonesian geography is is surabaya uh, is an island yes yeah okay. surabaya is uh, within the island of java okay so it's a uh, java east province yeah and is that where you're from as well i'm from the small town called putinokoro it is about three hours from surabaya okay and i don't live in the in the small town yeah i live in the village within the small town <laughs> <Okay>. so <laughs> nobody knows about this town let alone my village <laughs> <laughs> okay. so so then you moved away from from home quite quite early in your in your bachelor's career yes. or in your academic career yes yeah. i applied for a scholarship and i got uh, the scholarship and then went far away from my yeah. town <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, talking about uh, the scholarships, I mean, for being a PhD student quite uh, young in your academic career, um, you've gotten a lot of uh, grants and scholarships and awards. Mm -hmm. um, so like something like the, the, the most recent one being the Douglas Clyde or uh, Kong Shui yeah. Wilson. I think it's really hard to pronounce yeah. even for me. I yeah. think it's Swedish. I don't know. Oh, Dennis, okay. Dennis work. Could be, yeah. Yeah, it's from Matter Conference. I actually... Uh, applied for this uh, marine like mare mare prize they call it mare okay. mare prize student prize competitions mm -hmm. for this paper actually that we were discussing oh, yeah. about all yeah. right and then i just submitted that and i didn't expect for anything if i won then let it be if not then nothing to lose yeah and then um during the dinner of the conference they mm -hmm. announced that i won the prize which actually I didn't attend the dinner because I was with my kid oh, at the no. hotel. Oh, <laughs> and no. then the, and Andrea and also the host of the dinner yeah. uh, called me and then said that, Madeka, you won the prize. Please come, please come here. I was That's like, so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I didn't expect that. Yeah, yeah. Didn't go with expectation to win. So yeah, it was the best student paper award. Yes. Yeah, 2023. Yes. That's incredible. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How old is your kid? Uh, my kid, the first one, my elder son is three year old mm -hmm. and the youngest one is one year right now. All right. Yeah. yeah. I have uh, two kids. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so then move to the, to the Netherlands for, for your masters. Yes. That's, yes. It was, was that your first time living out of Indonesia or, or living away from Indonesia? Oh. I was going for a couple of student exchange before during mm -hmm. my bachelor degree. Okay. So, uh, so I went to Singapore and Singapore, Thailand, and also 
Japan for student exchange program. So oh, yeah, okay. that was my yeah. first um, internationally yeah. exposure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well traveled. And and, and again. Uh, and uh, Europe, the but the Netherlands is the first time for me to be living in in Europe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, how was that experience? It was incredible. I okay. love the Netherlands so much. Yeah. And the people. Yeah. I still met very great friend. Nice. Some great friends there, and we still been in touch up to today sweet yeah <laughs> did you live in Wageningen or yeah I yeah. live I live in Wageningen nice. and it was my first time as well to learn about what what marine governance is it's yeah. something that ah, okay. I don't know before yeah I didn't know before yet because we didn't have the term marine governance in our language mm -hmm. yeah and again like you got a Quite early in your career, again, you got a research grant from 2012 to 2015, mm -hmm. uh, a directorate of higher education, and it was for your undergrad research program. Yes. And what did you do with it? So Indonesian government has what they call PKM. So it's like a national student research competition. So okay. we could apply for this grant to get funding for any research uh, mm -hmm. so i did research for example in grouper fish mm -hmm. at that time because i focused on the aquaculture so i yeah. tried to find a way of improving the growth of the grouper fish at that time so i submitted yeah. that proposal to the government and the government actually accepted and nice. then I, i we yeah we basically sorry we received the the grant from the government and from that moment that i kept applying and applying so collecting more grants mm -hmm every now and then and yeah yeah perform the laboratory research yeah interesting <laughs> and then also like you mentioned you also moved to singapore for an exchange or internship what, what was it? it it was a student exchange program it's called uh the first asian international conference or workshop it, mm -hmm. and the topic uh, at the time that i focus on is about like uh, managing the mekong delta in vietnam mm -hmm. yeah. the, the health of the mekong delta river at the time and how we also uh, we also talk about like mangrove habitat conservation something mm -hmm. something like that yeah okay i i barely remember <laughs> what was going on yeah, it's with the conference <laughs> And what about Japan? What did you do there? Oh, Japan, I was trained for uh, UK Masera isolation. So we tried to isolate it, uh, the protein, specific protein collecting from red algae. Mm -hmm. They call it AQ, AQ Masera. And then the lectin was used to immobilize cancer growth mm -hmm. at the time. So I, I was there with, uh, yeah, my sensei, I forgot. Sorry, my sensei is your name. I forgot his name, so okay, I was there yeah. with, with my sensei and he taught me about, uh, yeah, AQ Masera mm -hmm. and how to isolate the specific protein for like reducing the mobility and also the growth of um, HeLa cell, yeah. the cancer cell growth. Yeah. And that was in Hiroshima? It was yeah. in Hiroshima, okay. yeah. Yeah, right. On a summer school, I just saw that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then one interesting part about your CV, which I, I, I have never seen this, um, is social theories where you have a section on theoretical frameworks yeah so can you explain this to me is this the ones you learned or the the ones that speak most to you or what is this <laughs> yeah social i think the letter the ones that speak most to me okay all right <laughs> so for example uh, yeah because i learned the social theory one of them for example social practice theory mm -hmm. and i was uh learning about the social practice theory during my master program and Social practice theory means we focus on the social practices instead of only the theory. See, That's yeah. very contradictive, yeah. right? But they call it social practice theory. For example, mm -hmm. at the time when I uh, I used the social practice theory for understanding why the, the fishers in Indonesia keep catching baby lobster or juvenile lobsters. Mm -hmm. And instead of focusing on their attitude and behavior, we focus on their practices. So we look at their technology they use, mm -hmm. the site, they, uh, why, why they choose uh, the, the, the lobster, the juvenile lobster or baby lobster for their target species. And yeah, so we focus on their, their activities, basically. Practices mean activity or their actions and how their action actually shape their behavior. So mm -hmm. the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> so like flipping the, the logic, usually we focus on the, how the behavior yeah. shape the action. This mm -hmm. one is how the action shape the behavior. Yeah. Like then this social practice theory focus on the routinized activity. Mm -hmm. For example, when you are reading, reading is practices. So mm -hmm. 
this also define you so it's also shape your behavior that then in turn you become i don't know a read uh, a book lover for yeah. example something like yeah that. nice <laughs> yeah this perspective flipping you, yeah. you you do that a lot a lot that's, <laughs> that's, that's that's cool i i love it like um one of the theories that you mentioned here is uh, feminist geopolitics mm -hmm. and you've also applied this in in the paper that we talked about yes. before yes yes yeah. yes Where you flipped, or, or sorry, do you want to say it? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so basically, when we talk about geopolitics, let's yeah. say more the most controversial one, let's say the invasions of Russia to Ukraine, for mm -hmm. example, we focus on uh, Putin and the uh, Ukraine Ukrainian leader, but we forgot on the bodies how this invasion affected the bodies, which is the Ukrainian people body. Mm -hmm. So the feminist geopolitics sort of flip the logic there instead of focusing on the conflict between these two leaders of course they are important yeah. Yeah. we focus on the vulnerable fragile bodies of the ukrainian okay yeah citizens yeah. that they for example have to go abroad and then deal with the cultural shock learn new language yeah. and maybe missing a lot of history there so we instead instead of uh, you know focusing on on the story of the the state geopolitics mm -hmm. focusing on the body where they are affected intimately by the conflict the same is for the thin diving yeah. instead of focusing on the international mm -hmm. thin operations uh, we focus on the bodies on which the thin international op intervention mm -hmm. managed special planning this kind of regul regulatory intervention actually affect the thin divers bodies and the idea around how the thin divers body affect the international regulatory interventions itself That's something like that super interesting yeah yeah i love that perspective <laughs> flipping <laughs> and other people seem to like it as well since you've won an award for it so i i don't know <laughs> I, i i think it was a beginner luck maybe <laughs> yeah, okay you think so i don't know but i i tried to kind of like experiment yeah. um, the the concept there yeah nice how, how did you um get into this like wh when did you first do it this perspective flipping in writing or i don't know in everyday life if you do it as well yeah because i read a lot of like science technology studies scholars mm -hmm. and we had discussions kate and i so i think i was inspired a lot by my supervisors of course okay yeah to think like uh beyond like the norm mm -hmm. <laughs> i would say and try to assess critically for example when we talk about sustainability is it really sustainable mm -hmm. uh, and then we look instead of looking at the standard practices of sustainability we focus on how it has been implemented in the field so we are looking at the field instead of the documents mm -hmm. something like that so yeah. flipping yeah <laughs> super interesting logic flipping yeah yeah exactly <laughs> And then your work experience and employment history, you mentioned that from May 2019 to September 2019, you, you worked on value chains and partnership at Alun Aqua. Yeah. So basically for a, for a I, I, I find this uh, qu quite interesting because it's like assessing a, a value chain of shrimp. Is it like shrimp farms? Or? Yes, shrimp yeah. farms. Right. Uh, it was about shrimp farms. So I was assessing the shrimp farm value chain fanami vanami yeah. uh, shrimps okay. in indonesia because we are one of the biggest the largest yeah. stream port producer yeah yeah apart from china i think we are the second or the third mm -hmm. and yeah so i assessing their uh, what kind of feed they use where they actually um you know uh, have the farm and what are difficulties that they encounter to export their streams mm -hmm. Yeah, and try to connect the farmers with the feed companies. Uh, what kind of like uh, governance interventions or like uh, practices that may help the local stream farmers? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in there that this is together with NGOs and uh, government and private actors. Yes. So, okay. Yes. Right. These these three sisters, I would say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. What, what's the NGO role in this? Uh, so the NGO role, usually they focus on the things that are not uh, being assessed. For right. example, like uh, the well-being of the stream farmers. Ah, okay, yes. Or like uh, ecological assessment, Yeah. right? Because the feed companies only focus on the revenue yes. and focus on, for example, the productions of the stream uh, farmers. Okay. But then like the NGO try to add more aspect that could provide, you know, like more comprehensive mm view of the stream farming yeah and that's something you mentioned as well in um your social theories well-being theory is is one of your yeah uh, one major of. ones 
And you also applied this to uh, fisheries progress? Is yeah. that what they're called? Yeah. yeah, fisheries progress is, again, uh, the American nonprofit organization. Right, okay, yeah. And then uh, fisheries progress has uh, an application and a website called Fish Choice. Mm -hmm. So they try to help, like, the Global North customers. Yeah to find like uh or to trace the fish they eat mm -hmm. so you can use their use their app you know and my role there is to help or to communicate or to make sure that the translations mm -hmm. of the policy that see that fish progress made is understandable for uh, fishermen mm -hmm. in indonesia because the fishermen are the ones that implement the policy yeah so i i'm helping them to translate Nice. their uh, yeah fishery progress guideline for local fishers in into the language of bahasa bahasa yes bahasa. okay mm -hmm. right and that's that's your native language or, or? that's my national language my okay. native language is javanese yeah. language yeah All right, okay. <laughs> so, so the, these two you speak fluently in these two i speak fluently okay yeah. <laughs> and and what what about dutch and german i saw those in i your CV. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm still learning dutch however dutch and Dutch. yeah um <laughs> i the the dutch is i think still there because we are actually borrowing a lot of words like Dutch word but yeah. for Dutch, yeah it's it still i'm still learning from, from yeah yeah no <laughs> sorry no 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 pressure <laughs> german but yeah because right now i i try to balance uh, the time for my work and the time mm -hmm. for my family it's Absolutely. really hard to juggle but yeah, yeah but on everyday basis i talking to my neighbor i use my <laughs> broken german yeah. and they are happy yeah, no, <laughs> I, I, I bet they're super happy with you yeah. being that adaptable it's it's, it's nice they're uh, so kind of my neighbors yeah <laughs> <laughs> cheers to my yeah, neighbors yeah. my flat <laughs> yeah how's uh did your family move with you to here yes yeah. uh my wife and my two kids move uh, with me here yeah nice we live in Kraienburg, if you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite not far, not not that far, 15 minutes from from the city center. Yeah, yeah. nice. Do you bike here by f from there or? No, we haven't uh, bought a bike or, you know, subscribe a bike yeah. rent. Okay. Uh, so I always use bus, like the campus bus okay. to go to this yeah. office, yeah, to yeah, go nice. to our office, yeah. Sweet. How's, how's living in Germany with... With I, the family. I love Oldenburg so much. You do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. No, this is not sugar coating at all. Yeah. My wife and I really love Oldenburg so much and we hope that maybe in the future we can get employed. Yeah. By HIFMB for a postdoc. Oh yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> right. Know, yeah, right? I was gonna ask Probably, this. Right? <laughs> cool. Okay. But yeah, we enjoy. We really enjoy. Um and our neighbor is so sweet. Um mm -hmm. yeah. So we really enjoy living here in Oldenburg. in Oldenburg. It's very peaceful. Yeah. And a very friendly city, so we really love it. Nice. So much. It feels like home. Yeah. <laughs> if I may ask, please let me know if that's too personal. But what's uh, raising two kids during a PhD like? It was. It means that you will have lack of sleep every night. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then, um, it was really hard because I want to spend more time with with that. Mm. But in real life, we have to make a trade off. Yeah. And that's what I tell my wife that I. I'm I'm so thankful for her sacrifice. I think she's like she's my rock, <laughs> my wife. <Nice. laughs> um, uh, yeah, so it's really hard. Um, but at the same time, I have to acknowledge my privilege because I'm here because of the sacrifice of my wife. So I don't want to uh, take for granted for her sacrifice, you know, it, which means that I have to work hard. Yeah. And and I don't want to traumatize that. I think I enjoy it. So it's really nice because when I go home, then I can forget about my work mm -hmm. and be busy with kids yeah. and Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really nice actually to have kids uh, during the PhD, okay. you know, despite the sleepless night, for yeah. example. You started in 2021, yes. your PhD. Yes. So um, your second child was born during? During, yeah, during yeah. the field work yeah. oh, right. oh, <laughs> in nice. 2022. Yeah, okay. yeah it was it was a really hard time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Did you did you get to live anywhere close to to where you grew up or during field work or was So during the field work, uh we decided to uh I I need to live uh in the field work in the field site where I conducted the field work mm -hmm. and my wife uh went back to our island to our hometown. Yeah, nice, okay. And so we kind of like having like this long 
recent relationship yeah. while I was collecting the data. Yeah, that must and hard. Yeah, she was pregnant. So it was really hard because at that time, during my field work, sorry for being too personal. No, no. Uh, so during my field work, for example, um, I couldn't meet my father because my father passed away and I still collected the oh. data. And I was working with the company, so I could not like go away all of a sudden to visit my uh my my late father right yeah, yeah. and then i had to book the flight and so on and so forth but above that i think there's a good thing from this story because if my wife was not pregnant at that time mm -hmm. we may not have seen our father for the last time so <laughs> there was yeah. blessing in disguise yeah if you if you will yeah yeah i'm sorry to hear that yeah it's a it's a part of the the PhD life, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but there is a, a feminist scholar from Australia, Barbara mm -hmm. Zone, 2023. She also had a vlog or podcast like this, and she said that PhD exists not to make you happy. <laughs> PhD exists to make a bridge between your current life to your future life. Yeah. Which is, I, I feel like that's so true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with it. Yes. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly why I did it as well. It's because it's kind of needed in the academic, um, or at least in, in my field. Um, and that's exactly why I did my PhD as a bridge for my, my life now. And it was hard as well, right? Yeah, not, not nowhere near as hard as yours. I'm, I'm sure um, I didn't have all these hardships like, like that you encountered. But yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. <laughs> Push. Cheers for all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. people. But it was definitely worth it, and it is, and uh, a lot of fun as well. A lot of fun. Yeah. I met you, met everyone here. They are lovely <laughs> yes. people. I think, I think it's a privilege because we are paid for producing knowledge. Mm. It's a it's a privilege by itself, yeah. and not many people will have this kind of privilege. So yeah. we have to own that privilege and do it properly. Yeah. That's so nicely said. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Really, I'll really great again from Barbason. She also said that great scholar or scholar should not run away from difficulty. Yeah, exactly. And hardship. Yeah, I think that's all PhD students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not 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 romanticizing difficulty. No, but that is like the value that Absolutely. we have to yeah, carry it. on. Yeah, totally agree with it. <laughs> so what, what's the status now of, of your PhD? Are you done with field work? I'm done with my field work yeah. and now I'm finishing my dissertation outline that I will present during my third TSC meeting. So hopefully uh, my TSC committee, yeah. this is advisory committee, will be satisfied with the progress. When and is it? Uh, it will be on 9 October. Oh, okay, right. really, really <laughs> soon. <laughs> okay, good luck. Yeah, thank you very much. Do, do you feel ready? I think I feel ready uh, with the dissertation outline. Yeah. I'm kind of like, hopefully, still, of course, uh, reaching toward the end. Yeah. I mean, with the chapter you presented here today, I, I, I feel like this is such incredible work and definitely. Thank you. Yeah, you're an incredibly bright scholar, I think. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, I'm flattered. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. Yeah, yeah no worries. Thank you for, for bringing all this to us. Um, so we're already uh, at the 45 minute mark. Uh, this cool. went by quickly. <laughs> this feels so fast. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, you already mentioned where you would want to be next. You you would want to stay in Oldenburg? I want to stay in Oldenburg yeah. if I can get my postdoc. Yeah. Or anywhere in Europe, probably, especially Germany or the Netherlands. Yeah, okay, <laughs> nice. So that is like my target. So I try to uh, get my work published so that I can apply for a yeah. postdoc because right now postdoc requirement demands yeah. publications yeah, yeah but you've got some publications already yeah one <laughs> okay right one uh, two <laughs> two the second one is uh second author okay yeah and for your phd requirement does it need to do, do you have to have uh, publications published or it's still quite liquid or fluid right now because okay. uh kim and i were thinking about like whether we could like make this paper into chapters or the other one Largely depending on the review process and publication mm -hmm. process. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I'm under a three year PhD model mm. um, that if I, for example, uh, need my work get published, yeah. however, it takes so much time. So I think it's, mm. it's, it's not 
possible, right? Because yeah. we need to yeah be strategic with the time. I think that's what I want to say. Did you get any COVID extensions or anything? Or I we we're gonna discuss uh, this uh, PSG extensions okay. with uh, my TSE committee. Yeah. So it's something that we need to discuss in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I but wish you all the best of luck you. with it. <laughs> thank you very much. Wish me luck. I hope that I can nail this it's the project yeah and i'm sure, I'm sure. be successful yeah. because i'm so wo- <laughs> i'm a warrior <laughs> yeah, exactly yes yeah yeah you are for sure okay is there anything that you feel like we, we didn't mention that you want to cover um i want to say thank you very much for having me and no for worries. inviting me and we are materializing this podcast yeah. with me because we were already planning since october yeah or I september know. 2021 yeah, like so it was ago. already <laughs> the past but i was dealing with the uh, visa issues and so on and so forth yeah. and now i'm here so i'm so glad to meet you here in person thank you very much exactly for yeah thanks so much for coming nice questions yeah it's been it's been super interesting i love your work and and i hope thanks. it continues and gets published soon yeah thank yeah. you very much thanks <laughs> see you around want to dive deeper surf over to hifmb.de or follow us on twitter at hifmb underscore ol